Hi, welcome to another episode of MYD Global. I'm your host, Leanne Hackman Cardi. Today, this episode is with Amanda Lamont. Amanda's actually out of Melbourne, Australia, and she works with the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience. She's also the co founder and vice president of the Austral Asian Women in Emergency Network. Today, we're going to talk to her a little bit about disaster resilience in Australia and what they're doing as far as best practices and tools and resources that they're making available to communities and how she sees her role and some of the the work that she's doing in making Australia more disaster resilient. So stay tuned. Amanda, thank you for being with me today. It's great to be with you. Uh, I know you're in Melbourne, Australia, and I've given a little intro of, of your background, but please go ahead and tell us a little bit about, you know, your, your professional background, what, what drives you in this area. Yeah, sometimes when I'm talking about what I do, I, I can describe my life as it's a bit of a disaster because I've been working in disaster resilience and emergency management for some time, um, and I work in that uh, in my professional capacity. I've had roles uh, at the Australian Red Cross and at local government working in emergency management. I also volunteer a bit of my time in emergency capacity. So I am a volunteer firefighter, and I'm also um, a volunteer with the Australian Red Cross in emergency services. Uh, so I get to do lots of things in emergencies, both in a volunteer and a paid capacity. On top of all of that, I live in a really high bushfire prone area in Victoria, in Australia. Um, It's a beautiful house, a beautiful wooden house on a steep slope surrounded by lots of trees. So in terms of all of those capacities, um, I have a lot of exposure to um, our conversation nationally and internationally around emergencies and disasters and disaster resilience is something that I'm really passionate about. Well, and I know that you work with the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience. So can you just explain a little bit about what the Institute does? Yeah, the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience is funded by the Australian Commonwealth Government. And uh, it has its partners, the National Council for Emergency Services, the Australian Red Cross, and the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre. So those three partners really bring together the expertise of emergency services, together with the research um, over years of, of research with lots of researchers around Australia, and also with the Australian Red Cross international humanitarian expertise. And we think that places the Institute in a really good position to draw on all of the expertise to become uh, what is essentially a knowledge hub. So bringing uh, people and information together in one place that's really easily accessible by lots of people and we're talking about uh, not just the traditional lights and sirens emergency services we're talking about um, um, people that work in local government uh, community groups private sector researchers the health sector and all other emergency services so um, these things uh, it's really important that these organizations have access to information so that they can actually work on their resilience in an emergency context and so when, when you talk, it's interesting because uh, in North America here, I think we're hearing more and more of resilience as a buzzword. It's the, you know, everybody says, oh, we're going to be a resilient community. I, I think you guys are ahead of us in that regard. Can you kind of explain from your perspective what, what you would define or how you would define resilience when it comes to a community? Yeah, it is a real buzzword. And, and, and just before I start, I, I'd like to say some people think that we're overusing the word. I love the word. I think it's got a role and I think we should stick with it. So stick with resilience. Uh, It is getting used a lot, but I think that's a good thing. It's not a sign to start thinking of something else. So going back with a bit of history, you may be aware back in 2009, there were some horrendous bushfires here in Victoria, very close to where I'm sitting right now, actually. Uh, There was a Royal Commission after those fires and um, a lot of work has been done at a national level to look at how we manage emergencies and what we can do to build our, our resilience and particularly disaster resilience. So a national strategy for disaster resilience was uh, published in 2011. And the key concepts of the national strategy for disaster resilience talk about shared responsibility And it talks about key stakeholders having a role to play in building our resilience. So, as I mentioned, not just the traditional lights and sirens, um, but this is around um, the private sector, community groups, households and individuals, 
um, all different sectors of the community uh, and the country coming together and understanding their role uh, in building their resilience. Now, going to your question about what is resilience, I think that can be a very personal level at an individual or a household level. Uh, resilience in that context means the ability to sort of withstand the shocks and stresses that come our way and carry on. So to be to, to carry on with our lives and, and live a life that we value, which is what uh, some people here talk about in Victoria, about what that means when we are resilient to life stresses, bumps and shocks that come along the way. So that's, in a, that's at a personal social level resilience. How can we um, deal with things that come and upset our normal routines and carry on in a productive way? And then at a broader level, there's obviously infrastructure resilience. So the ability of infrastructure to withstand shocks and stresses in a physical sense and perform their function. Also power and electricity and school services, the education, the health system, the hospitals. So it's the resilience of us as individuals. It's the resilience of our infrastructure and our critical services. And also it's the resilience, again, of our, our economy, our financial resilience. How strong is our, um, our small businesses, our medium and large businesses to withstand the shocks that come as a result of emergencies? And, and finally, that fourth pillar we talk about is our environmental resilience. Uh, we're talking about environmental degradation at the moment with climate change and how that's impacting the way we're experiencing disasters, longer bushfire seasons, stronger storms, uh, more heat waves, drought. Um, that's what we're experiencing in Australia. So our resilience is bearing in mind that uh, firefighters, for example, are being asked to uh, uh, fight fires in our winter. Um, and we've had that the last two years. We've seen images of fire trucks driving through snow. Um, so what we're seeing there is um, uh, longer, str stronger, more severe um, emergencies and our resilience in the emergency sector to, to keep stepping up time and time again, sometimes disasters happening over the top of each other. And we're asking yeah. individuals and households their role to have a look and say, well, how are you going to do it? What's your resilience look like? How are you going to cope every summer knowing that you live uh, in the bush, surrounded by trees and the risk that you could lose things? Yeah. And that's and that's exactly right. I mean, that discussion is really starting in North America. Uh, I know you spoke about the various stakeholders. I know they refer, I think, in the U.S., it's that whole of society type of approach. Yeah. Uh, but really, you're right. I mean, if we, as individuals, as businesses, as communities, we all have to look at what we can do to become more resilient because it's not a matter of, uh, you know, if it's going to happen, it's when. And so making sure we have the tools and resources available is, is just smart. Um, I know the other thing you, you get involved in, and one of the things I saw on uh, your LinkedIn post was uh, this crowdsourcing that you're doing right now with this uh, Women in Emergency Network. Can you explain what that's all about? Yeah, so um, about a year and a half ago, uh, I was at a breakfast celebrating International Women's Day with a bunch of colleagues and, and connections uh, uh, that I have through my work in disaster resilience. And one of the women who works in social services, um, she said, I had this idea about um, a women in emergencies network. What do you think? And I said it was a great idea. And one of my colleagues from the Australian Red Cross also thought it was a good idea. So the three of us met the following week and had a coffee and said, yeah, let's do this. There's nothing in that space, nothing to, to really connect women who, who, who have a role to play in emergencies. So a year and a half on, uh, we have nearly 1,200 members. We wow. have changed our name from the Australian Women in Emergencies Network to the Australasian Women in Emergencies Network because our, our, our cousins uh, across the sea in New Zealand decided they wanted to join us as well. And we now have interest from women in the Pacific and also in Southeast Asia. So we are really expanding at a rate of knots. We have a national committee and we're all volunteering our time. So we're celebrating and supporting the really important role that women in particular play in emergencies and particularly in resilience. So we see women as a critical figure at a community level, but also as leaders in their organisations to build that collective resilience. That's great. That's great. So, I mean, just as we wrap up, just curious as far as, in, in your opinion, what you've seen in, in your professional life here, um, what are some of the biggest challenges and opportunities that you're seeing for communities when it comes to becoming more resilient? Uh, I, as a firefighter, I feel qualified to, to talk uh, for emergency services, 
Um, we are really committed and passionate about the work that we do in terms of our service to communities to, to assist them in sometimes what's the worst day of their life. Um, so we, we're driven by that. And in Australia, we have a really strong volunteer base. It's quite phenomenal and possibly unmatched anywhere else in the world. One of the challenges is people have got very used to um, this huge volunteer base, whether it's the emergency services or fire services, um, rolling up in the big red trucks and helping them in the crisis. Um, what that means is that people haven't always perhaps paid as much attention to their own responsibility for their own safety and to protect uh, the things that they value. So one of the biggest risks here is that it's always sort of been okay before generally and the firefighters have come or the emergency services have come and helped us and it's been okay. So what we're saying to people now is we really need everybody's help to pitch in and help neighbours and help each other because uh, we are uh, going to get overwhelmed with the number and type and severity and length of emergencies. So one of the biggest risks here is for people to understand that um, Australia is a beautiful place. We're so lucky to, to work here and to live here, but things do go wrong. And in, a, in an environment of complacency, um, where we have a strong economy, we have good jobs, we live in nice houses, we have a great social environment, we have a beautiful environment, sometimes we can get relaxed and complacent. You may have heard the expression, she'll be right, mate. Um, what, what I say is it might not be. And what are you going to do on that day, which could be the worst day when disaster comes? And, and I talk a lot in my role at the Australian Red Cross around the little things that people can do at their, in their homes that can really make a big impact um, in their recovery if they do suffer that stress and trauma from an emergency. Yeah. No, and that's awesome. Um, I actually work, uh, have had good relationships with the Canadian Red Cross here. Uh, they've been very good on, on funding resilient projects and innovative uh, programs. So I, I'm glad that you're connected with the Australian Red Cross. So that's really it. I mean, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us about more about what you're doing in Australia to make communities there most more disaster resilient. And I will provide a link to your websites and, and any tools that people can, can hopefully access, because I think though we live on different continents, uh, we deal with very similar issues and, and things that are cross-cultural. It doesn't matter where you're located. These, these are just smart things to do, right? So, so thanks well, again. That's right. Connecting people with knowledge and information is really important, and that doesn't stop at our, our national border. Um, I'm really passionate about connecting overseas and internationally uh, with our neighbours and with our friends uh, across the Atlantic. So, um, yeah, please share information backwards and forwards, and, and together um, we're going to be stronger than, than separately. That's awesome. So thanks again, and uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, uh, feel free to Tune in to more episodes of MOID Global and we'll find out more things disaster. So thanks again, Amanda, and uh, hope to stay in touch. Thanks a lot.